There were a lot of games released for the Nintendo DS. With a total of 3,467 DS games that were released in all regions of the world, you know there were bound to be some good games, some bad games, and games that are a real blast. And yes, blast is a pun because today I'm going to play Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare for the DS. Call of Duty A vastly popular first-person shooter series that ranks as the fourth best-selling video game franchise of all time. Since the series debuted in 2003, there has been a new Call of Duty game pretty much every single year, with each game selling millions of copies worldwide. With a series as successful as this, it's not surprising that Activision and Infinity War tried to release their games on as many consoles as they could. This was especially apparent around the year 2010 when a lot of people claimed that around this time, Call of Duty was at its golden age. One of the lesser known consoles that Call of Duty games were released for was the Nintendo DS. I mean heck, Wikipedia doesn't even list the DS as being a console that these games were released for. The DS had a whopping total of 5 Call of Duty games released for it from the years 2007 to 2011. And today, I will be playing the first Call of Duty DS game, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, which released in 2007, and I'll be describing my experience as I play it. Is it a gem on the DS, or is it absolute garbage? Let's find out. Right off the bat, you can tell that this game is a very watered-down version of the home console release version. There's your standard campaign single-player mode that has a total of 12 missions, instead of the home console's 18 missions. Also, this game lacks online multiplayer. At the time this game was released, the DS was more than capable of handling online multiplayer, or Mario Kart for the DS had online multiplayer, and that game was released a whole two years before this Call of Duty game. Despite this, you can't really blame Nintendo for not including online multiplayer for this game. Yes, Call of Duty was popular at the time, but Nintendo had no idea how well this game would sell for the DS, and if it was even worth using up their money and resources to have servers for online multiplayer for this game. So in place of online multiplayer, the DS version uses local multiplayer, where if you have two DSs in close proximity to each other, you can play multiplayer with up to four players at a time. I don't know any other person that owns this game, so I can't test out multiplayer, but I tried walking around the multiplayer maps in solo mode, and to my surprise, Local multiplayer in this game actually has quite a bit of depth to it, where there are four game types of Free For All, Hunter Slash Prey, Team Deathmatch, and Capture the Flag, which all work similarly to their home console counterparts. For each game mode, you can choose your character, weapon, and map, where there are seven different multiplayer maps you can choose from. I could actually see multiplayer for this game being pretty fun if you have a group of three other buddies to play this game with. So after exploring multiplayer for a bit, I decided to play the main part of this game, the single player campaign. The story for this game isn't all that in-depth, where you occasionally get voice-activated cutscenes or short messages at the beginning of each mission to read. There are two general narratives in this game, where some missions take place in Russia, where you have to stop the spread of communism, and the rest of the missions take place in the Middle East, where you have to fight radical soldiers. Later on in the game, you realize that these Russians and radical Middle Eastern soldiers are working together, and you have to fight both of them as a variety of different US and British soldiers. The story of the DS version is a little different from the home console version, where the DS version has a lot of separate side missions that are in support of the main events that happen in the home console version of this game. However, there are a lot of maps that are similar between the versions, such as this boat level, or this level where you're a TV operator and have to shoot guns at people at buildings below. So with that, let's take a look at the gameplay of this title. At the beginning of this game, you have the option to choose between Easy, Normal, and Hard Mode. For this video, I played the entire campaign in Normal Mode because that was the default mode, and quite frankly, I have no desire to play this game any longer than I need to, so I did not play on Hard Mode. For the first mission, you see yourself in a training camp, where identical looking soldiers with different names teach you the controls, how to shoot, and how to perform various combat actions. So let's back up for a minute and talk about how the game controls. Depending on if you're left-handed or right-handed, in one hand, you hold the stylus and have to use the touchpad on the DS to aim your gun and change which direction you're facing. You also use the stylus to switch your gun and toggle between if you want to throw a grenade or a smoke screen. With the other hand, you move the D-pad or face buttons and shoot using the L button or R button. While reading reviews online, I saw a lot of people complain about how these controls are annoying and hard to play with. However, after playing the whole game, I had to say that the controls take some getting used to, but not long into playing the game, I felt very comfortable with them and I didn't find controlling my character annoying at all. For getting the footage for this video, I used an emulator with an SNES controller to move, and a computer mouse for the stylus, which was a little annoying, but I played a bit of the game on my actual DS and it felt pretty normal. It felt a lot like playing Kid Icarus Uprising on the 3DS, if you've ever played that before. I liked using the touchscreen to aim down my sights, because it gives you a level of precision even higher than the home console releases that use a joystick. One aspect of the controls that I thought was slightly annoying was that in order to use the scope of your gun, you have to double tap the touchpad, when you're in combat and getting shot at, it can be a bit annoying to have to double tap the touchscreen to aim down your sights, where it would be a lot easier to hold down a button to use your scope of your gun, like how the home console game tab it. I can't think of how the DS version could remedy this issue, due to the lack of buttons, so double tapping the touchscreen to aim is probably the best option here. I guess the option to use the face buttons to move your gun instead of the stylus would be nice, because then you could use the L or R button to use your scope, 
But with that option, you don't have the level of aiming precision that comes with using the stylus. So after teaching you how to aim and throw grenades, you are introduced to these touchscreen gimmick minigames that are required to disarm bombs, where you have to trace wires or rotate squares to make lights turn on. These minigames seem a bit goofy, take away the immersion of combat, and seem more in place with some DS educational game for toddlers. Like hold on private parts, I had to trace something real quick. I guess you have to give props to the developers for trying out something new, but I couldn't help but chuckle to myself whenever I came across one of these things. For the last part of the training, you are taught how to call in an airstrike. In order to learn how to do this, you may expect the game to just tell you what buttons to press, or at the very most, ask you to call in an airstrike in an empty open field to experience what it's like. However, Major Woody here decides that the proper way to learn how to call in an airstrike is to blow up your own million dollar tank. I can't even fathom how this could possibly be a good use of resources. Also, what makes it even stranger is that right after you blow up your own tank, a bunch of bad guys show up and start gunning you down. They must have been in hiding, and as soon as they saw me blow up my own tank, they were like, holy crap, these guys have no idea what the heck they're doing, now's our chance. To be real though, I thought that this enemy invasion during the tutorial section was pretty cool, and it was a pleasant surprise. I'm so used to boring tutorial sessions in video games, so the nice twist in this game was a pleasant surprise. After taking out some bad guys on foot, you hop into a truck and use a mounted gun to take enemies out while driving. Missions like this are pretty common in Call of Duty, but it was actually fun to play through and was pretty action packed. After this truck ride, you do some more shooting around on foot, where I found probably the most unbalanced and overpowered weapon in this game, the sniper rifle. In this mission, you're tasked with taking down an enemy sniper in one of the windows, so you have to sneak around and avoid getting shot by him. And I died at least 10 times trying to kill the guy due to how good of a shot he was. If you so much as put a finger in the guy's line of sight, you are dead. And it doesn't help that it's a one-shot kill if you get hit by a sniper rifle. Also, later on in the game, you eventually are able to obtain the sniper rifle. And it's just as deadly in your hands as the enemy's. Because if you so much as shoot someone's pinky toe, they're dead instantly. So after a lot of sneaking around, trying to figure out what window the sniper was hiding in, I managed to take him out and end the mission. Another thing I should probably talk about that's pretty much the elephant in the room is this game's graphics. If I had to make an analogy, I'd say the Xbox 360 version of this game looks like how fast food looks in the advertisements. And the DS version of this game looks like the fast food you actually get, except the diarrhea you get after eating the food somehow looks better than the food itself. There's really no comparing the graphics between the two versions. I'd say the DS version of Call of Duty is comparable to the original Doom graphics, where that game came out in 1993. Almost every single sign or poster on the wall is impossible to read, and some objects were just represented by a handful of pixels even up close. It's easy to hate on the DS Call of Duty's graphics, but you honestly have to cut the game some slack. The game probably couldn't have been made to look much better, considering the hardware the developers were working with here. Also, during my playthrough, I was surprised at how smooth the gameplay was, where I never once noticed the game running less than 30 frames per second. I'd much rather take smoother gameplay with pixelated graphics over choppy gameplay with nice graphics any day, so this was very nice to experience. Then again, there also wasn't much going on at any given moment while playing, where occasionally you'd see an explosion while fighting, which just looked like a steaming meatball covered with marinara sauce. The next mission took place on a boat, which looked very similar to a mission on the home console release version of the game, despite the obvious graphical downgrade between the two versions. While playing this level, it made me realize how broken or simple some of the NPCs act. A lot of the time, enemies just face the opposite direction, despite you being right next to them, or sometimes they just randomly phase out of existence. Also, one annoying thing that happens a lot is that when you get close to an enemy, you can melee them, but there's a high chance that when you melee them, they can melee you at the same time, which just results in you two killing each other at the exact same time, because that makes sense, right? After gunning down a bunch of fishermen, I reached the end of the mission, which ended super abruptly. This abrupt ending in missions happens a lot in this game, which breaks the flow of the game, like, you'd expect a couple of lines of dialogue from your allies, right? A lot of missions just end immediately after you cross a certain line on the map, and text appears for a totally unrelated, at times, next mission. After gunning down some soldiers from an aircraft, in a pretty short and easy mission, the next mission took place on foot, where I traveled through a town. This area of the game was mostly uneventful, except I got my super overpowered sniper rifle at one point, and there was this interesting fighting sequence, where you get into hand-to-hand -hand combat with an enemy, where you have to slide your silas super fast in order to kill the guy, and if you don't move your silas fast enough, you die. This was a pretty basic mechanic, but it was interesting that this was literally the only point in the whole game that you get into a situation like this. I guess it just existed as a one-time fun thing gimmick to show the player what the DS could do differently from the other versions of the game, and I guess it showcased this well enough. So after completing that mission, I reached possibly my favorite part in the whole game, where the next mission takes place in this snowy area, where you're given a sniper rifle and have to take down a bunch of enemies and blow up tanks as you move along the road. You also have to take out this bridge and do a circuit board minigame to blow up a gate. There was also this cool part of the mission where you have to traverse a dark building with night vision goggles on and take out enemies. And the mission ended with this epic standoff in a hallway. I made a fool out of the enemies with my grenade and ended the level. 
right after playing the coolest mission in the game, I played perhaps the worst one in the whole game, where you are a TV operator and have to shoot guns at specific buildings and enemies below. I didn't like this mission in the home console release, but it was even worse in the DS version, due to it being hard to see stuff on the ground below, where the NPCs in your screen are resembled by like 6 pixels that jumble around to mimic walking and running. The only thing differentiating between your allies and the enemies is that your allies flash red. Also, it was surprising that the game didn't tell me that my allies were the flashing guys until decently well into the mission. Like, shouldn't you tell me who my allies are before I start trying to shoot people? Probably the worst part of this mission was that it was basically an auto-scroller where at times, I just had to wait around for my allies below to run from place to place, while I didn't even have anything to shoot at. You aren't even allowed to destroy the buildings or you fail the mission. You're forced to shoot only at specific buildings at specific times, and the skid mark on the endies is that there's no music during the whole mission, so you just sit there and wait while you hear the buzz of the plane. This is a sad change of pace in the game, because most of the game has really cool music that gets you excited while fighting, like here. One pretty funny piece of dialogue in this level was when one of your allies says this. Alpha two six, you gotta get out of there. Right when he says that, there's literally nobody outside to shoot at, so there's no threat at all outside. So after this slog of a level that lasted longer than it should have, in the next mission you take control of one of your allies on the ground in the same area that you were shooting down at below with the plane gun. This ground mission was pretty ordinary and non-eventful, where you just travel between rooms and kill bad guys. I'm pretty sure I found an easter egg in this level though, because if you go to some secluded area of the map, you can see an enemy at a shooting gallery practicing shooting, and you can sneak up on him and kill him. Like you'd think this guy would be actively fighting after hearing all those gunshots around him, right? In this next mission, your tracing skills and block rotating skills are really put to the test, where you have to defuse a bunch of bombs while fighting enemies throughout. I'm pretty sure I came across a glitch though, where I randomly excluded out of nowhere. Check this out. There was no timer or anything. I just walked next to the bomb and it exploded, and I tried walking up to the same bomb afterwards to try and recreate it, but I wasn't able to do it. I also discovered some further jankness when this idiot of an enemy was dumb enough to kill himself with his own grenade. After some more walking around, the mission ended with some high stakes tracing where I defused a bomb and beat the level. The next mission was a relatively fun and easy shooting from a helicopter mission where you shoot down at enemies below. I found it pretty crazy how indestructible your helicopter is in this mission though, because I was hit by an RPG multiple times, and the helicopter didn't even flinch. The RPG just bounced right off. After dropping a train into a bottomless pit, the next mission took place on the grounds, where I traveled through a building to try to find a computer to detonate a missile. This mission really showcased my teammate's ineptitude, where my teammate threw a grenade directly at himself, but he survived because apparently he's built different. After clearing out some rooms, I detonated the missile, which caused the camera located on the ground to get destroyed as well, which doesn't make any sense, but this game has dudes built like tissue paper and dark matter plated choppers, so I guess anything's possible, right? After that mission, I made my way to the final and most challenging level in the game. This mission starts out as an escort mission, where you have to find a vehicle to escape in, while keeping your buddy, Private Ackridge, alive. If Ackridge dies, you automatically fail the mission. What made this super annoying was that Ackridge barely cared about his own safety, where he liked to run into enemy fire and get himself killed. So I kept having to risk my life and run ahead of him in order to ensure that he didn't off himself. And what made this even harder was that the insta-kill sniper makes an appearance during part of this mission. After failing the mission quite a bit, in one of my attempts I made it to a truck and started this epic train chase sequence, where you had to shoot enemies that are shooting at you from a moving train. This was really easy, but it was actually a decently cool climax in this game. After this, the challenge in this game was a survival section, where you had to survive being shot at for a couple minutes until your buddies come to bomb the enemies. This part was somewhat hard, but I managed to persevere, beat the mission, beat the game, and the credits started to roll. The credits were your standard credits, but I found a pretty funny easter egg where the vice president of production of the game actually has the same name as that Ackridge guy in the last mission that kept screwing me over. Of course he would name himself after the most annoying NPC in the game. Also, it's worth mentioning that this game doesn't offer any extra challenges, achievements, or collectibles to find, like most Call of Duty games do. This really hurts the replayability of this game, where there's no real point to replaying the single player again after completing the campaign for the first time. I guess I could play the game on hard mode instead of normal mode as an extra challenge if I really wanted to, but I don't really see the incentive as it doesn't appear that it would unlock anything special. So that was Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare on the Nintendo DS. I know that I roasted this game a lot during this video, and it's hard not to, considering the graphics of this game, but I actually had a lot of fun during my playthrough. 
Well, I don't necessarily recommend anyone to play this game in today's day and age. If you had a DS back in 2007 and didn't have access to the home console version of this game, I would have recommended you pick this one up. In fact, if you've played the home console version of this game and you really liked it, you may enjoy playing the DS version as well, considering the DS version is so different from the home console version. It's basically its own game with its own story. Considering that there were a whole five Call of Duty games that were released for the DS, the games must have been perceived well enough by fans at the time of the release to warrant so many Call of Duty games being released on the same console. I actually own all five of these games, so let me know in the comments if you want me to make videos of the other four DS Call of Duty games that came out after the one I just talked about in this video. I'm genuinely curious if these games improved a lot on the jankness of the original, or if they're even more jank. I kinda want to make a series where I play obscure games like this that you've probably never played or heard of before, and document my experience in videos. Let me know in the comments if that's something you'd be interested in, and let me know what games you want me to play next. So with that, I'll see you in the next one.